everybody. It's been a little while since I've done an off-topic video, so I thought I would show my second balloon launch. I did this balloon launch about a year or two after my first one. The first one I sent up Uncle Sai, which was a bobblehead I stole from my boss. This time the intent was to send up a toy for my son and my daughter. You'll notice there's only one thing here though, the minion. On the other side of this, there's actually a princess, but sadly, for some unknown reason, that camera did not work. So with this beautiful backdrop, I thought I would walk through the process of actually doing this yourself, because this was an amazing project and so much fun to do for the entire family. So what do you need to do this for yourself? Well, let's start at the top and work our way down. There's going to be plenty of links down below for you to find the items that you need if you want to do this for yourself. The first thing you need is the balloon, obviously. When I did this originally, about five, six years ago, balloons were about 30 to $40. It appears that they have gone up in price. But what you're looking for is an actual latex weather balloon. Not a party balloon, not a six foot balloon, something that has a 30 foot burst diameter. At launch, it is not gonna be 30 foot, but 30 foot is what it will expand to as it go up through the different pressure gradients of the atmosphere. The first engineering problem I ran into during my launches was how do you affix the payload to the balloon itself? My particular solution was a plastic PVC pipe approximately the size of the balloon neck itself because you need something sturdy to mount your system to. So go to Home Depot or Lowe's, get some PVC pipe of the same diameter and cut off about two inches of PVC pipe. And what you're gonna do is you're going to literally stuff that PVC pipe into the neck of the balloon. Not all the way up, but just in the neck. And what that's gonna do is give you something solid to affix to. All of my suspension lines for this were paracord. So from there, I took some paracord, about four feet of it, and I taped it to the balloon around the PVC pipe. So that the PVC pipe was the structure and the tape was holding it to the balloon. And I had the paracord looped down so that I could use a carabiner to attach anything I needed to below that initial suspension line. After that, the next thing you need to add is a parachute. Because at some point this balloon is gonna pop and you need a way for it to come down somewhat controlled. During ascent, it's just gonna be hanging in between the balloon and the payload below. Another thing you have to remember though is that after burst, the remnants of that balloon and the PVC pipe that you've used to attach it are going to then fall down and they will collapse a certain portion of your parachute. Now as long as your PVC pipe is not too big, it should not be a problem for both of my launches, this was not an issue. After you have your parachute, the next thing you need is a radar reflector. I purchased my radar reflector, and again it appears that a lot of prices have gone up drastically since I originally did this. The reflector that I purchased was only about $30. On Amazon right now, they're listed for about 50 or 60. But in the links below, there's a website that teaches you how to build your own. Because honestly, all you need is some cardboard and tin foil. This reflector is to ensure that any aircraft in the area can see this balloon. Now below the reflector comes your payload. The payload is whatever you make it. I've seen people that have just built a square structure of PVC pipe and mounted cameras on clamps. What I did is I actually built a box for my payload. I used styrofoam from a cooler, hot glue, and I literally made a box. I made that box specifically so that I could fit the cameras I had purchased inside. Using this method, you have a lot of variation that you can do to the internals of the box. If you want to add more cameras, if you need more ballast on one side or another, it worked out really well for me. Now for those cameras, you're gonna need some plexiglass. After I had the initial design and construction of the box itself, I taped the plexiglass to the portholes where the cameras would be looking out. And as you can see, I used highly reflective and very visible tape. And this was with purpose, because you don't know specifically where this is gonna come down. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I used this tape to ensure the integrity of the box. I also wanted to try and make sure that the box itself was watertight, because again, God forbid this thing comes down in the middle of a lake. Inside my particular box, I had two flip cams. You can see how old this video is because I'm using flip cams. They don't exist anymore. But I had 
two flip cams, and then two underwater barrel type cams. Not very expensive, because honestly, you have to consider what happens if I never find this. So you have to debate how much investment you're gonna put into it. Total, I put in several hundred dollars for this build, but I've been able to use it twice. But that entire time, I have also recognized that there is a chance I'm not getting this back. The last component you really need to be concerned with is the GPS receiver. I actually used two different trackers. I had a GPS tracker for my dog because I have a Siberian Husky that likes to run through the woods and make me chase her. And its telephone interface was amazing because it's meant for you to track your dog running away from your house. But it relies upon cell phone service. And after a certain altitude, there is no service, which isn't ultimately that big of a deal because once the balloon comes back down, you regain service again. But I really wanted to track this through its entire flight. So I got a second emergency GPS tracker called a Spot. Spot has multiple different types of trackers. I went on the low end because again, I didn't want to lose too much money if I never found this. And the tracker that I got goes up to about 60 to 80,000 feet. And once it's turned on, it pings the satellite once every 10 minutes. It is not an active track, but with this, it allowed me to track the course throughout the entirety of the flight. And between these two trackers, I had very accurate tracking on the ground and in the air during flight and when I wanted to go find it. Now the last critical component for this entire project, helium. Helium, it turns out, in this quantity, is not easy to come by. You can go down to your local party rental store and buy several dozen tanks of helium for party balloons, but that's not quite gonna cut it. What you're gonna need, most likely, is a 120 cubic foot tank. Again, down in the description below is a website that'll allow you to calculate how much helium you should need based upon your payload. Because if you have a heavy payload, you're gonna need more helium. If you have a light payload, not quite so much. Problem is, you can't just buy that specific amount of helium. So you really need to aim high and accept the fact that you're gonna be returning a tank with a fair amount of helium still in it. Now, where do you get this helium? Welding supply stores. That is the only place that I've been able to find that had this size of tank of helium. The next trick though is that when you go into this welding supply store, there's a strong chance that they may need you to set up a corporate account. So you may actually have to go visit them rather than call or set up something online because these are companies that routinely rent to people on a regular basis. They're not expecting one random person to come in. But when that one random person does come in and asks for helium, they're going to assume that you need to fill a crap load of balloons, not one balloon. And when you rent from them, they're not going to give you the equipment you need for this application. They're going to give you the little bendy nipple on the tank to fill up balloons. Well, that is too high pressure for our balloon because that latex balloon is fairly delicate. So when you're talking to the person at the welding supply store, you need to ask them not to give you the little nipple, but you need a regulator, an actual regulator so that you can control the amount of air that's coming out. Because in the beginning of the fill, you need to go slow so that you don't accidentally punch a hole through the side of it with high pressure air. Once the balloon starts to fill, you can turn up the pressure a little bit. Next step, based upon the regulator they gave you, you need to find a fill hose. Generally, it's gonna be about a half inch, three quarters, something of that size, but you're gonna know that once you get the regulator. So you've got one more trip back to Lowe's. Now on the day of the launch, make sure you create your checklist. One by one, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna do it to make sure you don't forget a step? Make sure you have a tarp so that your balloon is not in contact with the ground because the worst thing that could happen is as you're about to launch, the balloon tears. So you've got your helium, you've got your balloon, you've got your rig, and you've got your hose to fill it. The way that I did it was I placed a zip tie around the bottom of the neck, not all the way closed, fed in the hose from the helium tank and started to fill and made sure that I had someone holding on to it the entire time. That way it didn't go too far in and didn't slide out. As you get closer and closer to the balloon gaining lift, tighten up the zip tie just a little bit so the hose stays in place. Because at some point that balloon is going to lift off the ground, but it's not going to have enough lift yet 
to actually take flight with your payload. I also used a fishing scale so that I could measure how much lift I had generated as I'm adding the helium. Now, if your payload is three pounds, make sure that your lift capacity is three pounds on the scale. At that point, you know your balloon will take your payload all the way to the stratosphere. Now, once you've reached that point, turn off the gas, pull out the fill hose, and cinch down on that zip tie. At this point, you are ready for launch. Make sure you've got all the ground cameras ready, do your countdown, and let go. So the next question you probably ask is, how do I know where it might come down? Once again, there's a website for that. The last website down in the description is a weather monitoring site. Generally, it recalculates once every 12 hours. You put in your specific launch location, your expected burst altitude, and it'll give you your expected landing point. Both times that I did this, I was within three miles of my landing site. You can't count on it to be exact, but it's a very good estimate. And I used this when I was doing my initial planning for the first launch, because at the time, I lived in North Carolina, and I wanted to launch from North Carolina. And every day for six months that I checked, even though I was in the middle of North Carolina, showed my balloon landing in the ocean. So clearly, the jet streams in North Carolina were not conducive to a balloon launch. So later that year, during a trip back home to the Dakotas, I checked in that area, and it only moved about 15 miles to the south. So make sure you know that your launch site is going to be good, and you're not going to have any problems having to go fish it out of the ocean or trekking through the mountains. Another thing to consider is time of year. My first launch was after harvest season, so all of the fields were empty. My second launch, the one you're looking at now, was right before harvest season. And we got lucky that as we went out to look for this balloon in the middle of the night, after some driving around and hitting up local bars, we were driving down a dirt country road and right at the edge of the cornfield, we could see the red parachute just hanging over the edge. But as lucky as we were, it could have been just as unlucky and we would have had to make a drunken trek through the fields. The last thing you need to be cognizant of is local laws. Technically, from the last time I launched, balloons under a certain weight capacity did not require FAA approval or airport notification. But it is never a bad idea to at least call your local airport and report in that you're going to launch a weather balloon. How long is the balloon going to be in the air, you might be wondering? Both of my launches were between two and two and a half hours. That was from launch to landing. And with that knowledge, you have to ensure that you've got the right cameras that are going to last long enough. None of the cameras I had froze because of the cold weather at the altitudes, but I'd seen some people that said throw some hand warmers inside the payload to make sure they stay warm. I did not have a problem with that. But this particular launch, as you see at the end, I didn't quite get the landing. Part of that was because I spent an extra 10 minutes fighting the wind for my launch. And I'm almost positive that if I had had that extra 10 minutes of footage time, I would have got the landing. My first launch, video ended two minutes after landing. And I'll tell you, one of the most exhilarating things from this entire endeavor is when you find that payload, make sure you bring your laptop and you pull out the memory card and you look at that footage. Because before you drive away, the exhilaration of seeing footage from 100,000 feet at the edge of space is a feeling I cannot describe. I've done many strange projects, as a lot of you probably know by now. This project, not only do I now have my own personal footage from the edge of space looking at the blackness, but my children now have toys that they know are astronauts. Anybody who's interested in a project like this, please feel free to reach out and ask questions. I'm not an expert in this, but I can probably give you a little bit of advice and hopefully make your launch as successful as mine were. And until next time, don't forget, look at that curve.
okay, I know it's a fish eye lens, give me a break, but it's still pretty damn cool.